Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be with you again. We invite the presence of your Holy Spirit. We're talking about very sacred things in this lecture. I pray that you'll help me to present them in a quiet but beautiful way as it's intended in the book. Or I ask it in thy name. Amen. Well, the title is Baptism, a Silent Doctrine of Old Sanctuaries. And I think you're going to see that that's an accurate uh, title. <clears throat> In Ephesians 4, 5, it tells us there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Now, speaking of one baptism, we know it doesn't mean baptize only once, because in the Bible, they baptized more than once. So what does it mean, one baptism? There are a lot of different ways of baptism today. Some baptize forward into the water. Uh, some baptize backward into the water. Some baptize three times. That's for the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Some sprinkle water, some pour water. When we were in the Philippines, uh, Evangelism Crusade, we were given to understand that there was a church that baptized with rose petals. A friend of mine was going to ministerial fellowship meetings in Minneapolis, and he said one of the largest churches there decided not to baptize anymore at all. They just thought there was too much conflict over it, and it wasn't worth it, so they just quit. Well, who's right? Who's wrong? Should you and I take it seriously? Well, the first thing I have to do if I'm going to teach what the record says is to lay aside human majority rules on the subject. That's always scary, but you always have to do it. Because a majority rule in one church would be quite different from the majority rule in another church on this same subject. Then, too, we've learned that, according to the Word of God, it's better not to place too much confidence in majorities anyway. Very seldom have the majority been right. Jesus mentioned that very clearly once when he talked about the wide and narrow gates. Well, we might take a look at that and see if we can find it. I'm sorry that things went backwards, but here they are. Matthew 7 Verse 13. Sometimes computers have a mind of their own, you know. <laughs> the text says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. This is one of those verses that let us know not everyone's going to be saved. Verse 14, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. <clears throat> We're desperate in this series of DVDs to find it. Plainly says in this text that the majority are out of step. Only the few are right. And if we sincerely want to find and follow the truth, then the quickest way is to get out of step with the majority. And we don't like that. The majority is our comfort zone. But to follow Christ, we have to leave our comfort zones. Look what happened to all the apostles or the disciples, especially the disciples that left their comfort zones. To follow Christ, most of them gave their lives. We're going to look at Peter's advice, 1 Peter 2.21, on this idea. And I think you'll find it as clear as that of Christ, only put just a little differently. <clears throat> for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. They're not comfortable steps. He suffered in those steps. 
When we make a choice to follow Christ, we're making a serious choice. But notice what it says. Leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps who did no sin. That would mean more to you that have been listening to the DVDs in the past. In, in honest truth, I don't want to speak quietly, but firmly, but this is a sacred subject. In honest truth, if we want to know what to do in any matter, we need to copy the life of Christ. No one will ever go wrong in the judgment or be, ever be ashamed in that day if they can say, we did what Christ did. Now, the ancient church at Ephesus bears a silent testimony to one of the things that Jesus taught his disciples and his apostles and left for us. The ruins are still there today and one of the main <clears throat> tourist attractions of the area. It was an important center of Christianity in the early centuries. Paul made two visits there. One was short, the next one was nearly three years and it became a center of the gospel for Asia Minor. A strong tradition has it that John the Revelator lived his remaining lives at Ephesus. In fact, the church is named in his honor. It's St. John's at Ephesus. St. John's of Ephesus was still a strong church as late as the 5th century. If you should tour that church today, you could hardly get away without the guide wanting you to visit the old baptistry. Of course, it's in ruins, but its beauty can still be seen. It's a beautiful pool, marble pillars, mosaic walls, the water area was four foot deep, holding several thousand gallons of water. Stairs leading down both sides into the water. And what does this do? It reveals the method of baptism in the early years. Tourists visiting many of the ancient churches come across this same fact. I have a picture of a few of them here. This one, a baptismal pool in Ravenna, 5th century. Uh, if you will look at it closely, though it's 1,500 years old or more, you can see in the corner of it the new uh, idea for a sprinkling area, but originally the whole pool is there. Here's one from Portier, France. You can see that you could step down into it from all sides. And then in uh, Tunisia, now look at this one. Uh, talk about beautiful artwork. That's a gorgeous pool. In fact, the people are still excavating these pools from ancient uh, uh, sanctuaries throughout the Middle East and throughout uh, Europe. The question is, what difference does it make? Or does it make any difference? What does mode have to do with it anyway? How I'm baptized by it, does that matter with anything? And is baptism necessary at all? Well, let's take a look at one famous text in Matthew 28, uh, 19 through 20. It might answer some of these very questions. Verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Did you notice that there was a teaching program that went first? No need in being baptized into something if you don't know what the something is. And verse 20 tells them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, friends, there are several things that just stand out at me in this text. The first thing that I looked at is the fact that baptism is not requested. Baptism is commanded. Go do it. It's a very sacred rite involved in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit there. The next thing I've already mentioned, the people were taught something first. And it even tells us what they were taught. All things commanded. Were you taught all things commanded before you were baptized? Well, that was the principal idea anyway. 
Our Lord explained uh, the way in which he would be with his people in this rite of baptism uh, when he talked to us in John 14, 15. And I want you to see this. And we'll go on further than that. We'll go a few more verses. <clears throat> if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. That's how he's going to abide with us, through the comforter. Uh, notice verse 26, please. Or did we read 16? Yes. Verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. Now friends, the Bible makes it very clear that the Holy Ghost has the ability to express God very well. In fact, I've put a few things here on the screen that you might enjoy. The Holy Spirit has knowledge in 1 Corinthians 2.9, has a will in 1 Corinthians 12.11, and has a mind according to Romans 8.17, is capable of love in Romans 15.30, capable of grief in Ephesians 4.30, may be insulted, according to Hebrews 10, 29, can be tempted in Acts 5, 9, can be lied to in Acts 5, 3, but most important of all, the Holy Spirit seals our eternal fate in Ephesians 4, verse 30. So, I plan to show you the meaning of baptism the history of the rite of baptism, and the sacredness of its symbolism. And I think you'll find it beautiful. Now in the lexicons, that is in the uh, interpretation books from Greek and Hebrew to English, we'll find that the word baptizo or baptism simply means to dip, to immerse, or to plunge under. All authorities that I know of are agreed that this word never meant anything but to immerse. It's interesting that Martin Luther wrote at one time these words. In, ba in Greek, to baptize signifies to dip. Baptism signifies two things, death and resurrection. That is full and complete justification. I could wish that the baptized should be totally immersed. You know, a lot of folk think that if Martin Luther had lived longer, he would have brought the Reformation along much further than he did. The word baptizo or baptism is used in dyeing fabrics. You can't throw the dye at a fabric. You have to dip it in the dye. It's used in washing pots. It's used in the idea of a blacksmith when he gets the iron hot and he baptizos it in a vat of oil or water to temper it. So what I'm saying is immersion seems to be the mode of baptism in the meaning of the word. It also helps explain why the early baptistries had so much water and could hold thousands of gallons. Then too it shed light on the water needs of John the Baptist. And that's pretty clear as well. And we'll find it in John 3, verse 23. Oh, these things are sacred. I think this is one of the most sacred and holy rites left to God's people. And I can understand the devil messing it all up because it is so holy and so necessary and so important. And so I've done what I could to dig what I can find out of the scriptures. And John, also baptizing in Anan near Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. John's baptism required a lot of water. Evidently, he baptized the same way John the Beloved would have in the church at Ephesus. 
But this raises a lot of questions. Uh, for instance, what about baptizing infants? I can s understand why someone would hesitate baptizing an infant by immersion. And I don't want anyone to think I would judge a person for baptizing an infant. But infants is not a very practical way for a baby. I recognize that. And perhaps, just perhaps, the whole households were baptized. This may be reason why there's not one instance of infant baptism mentioned anywhere in Scripture that I can find from Genesis to Revelation. The question is, who should be immersed? The Bible shows some very important prerequisites, and you should know what they are. Prerequisites for you and for me. The first one is in Acts 2, verse 37 and 38. Acts 2, verse 37 and 38. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be immersed. Or if you prefer Greek, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In verse 41 it adds, And they were that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Well, there's another one, another prerequisite mentioned in Mark 16, 16, where it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I don't know why anyone would be baptized that didn't believe. Why leave sins behind in the water if there's no repentance and there's no belief? And why demonstrate the death, burial, and resurrection if the can candidate doesn't believe it ever happened? See, that doesn't make sense. So both repentance and belief are very important requests prerequisites to baptism according to the Word of God. Earlier, we saw the importance of knowledge. Go ye therefore and teach all things. You need to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. If a person doesn't know what sin is, he can hardly repent of it. So you have to teach them what sin is, what transgression is. Really, the Bible indicates five steps that should be expected of the candidate. Knowledge, belief, Repentance, obedience, and followed by fellowship. Notice verse 47, where it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord had added to the church daily such as should be saved. They were added to the called out ones, the ecclesia, the church. Now, I'm going to suggest that perhaps because an infant can't do any of the above things, is more of a problem to baptizing them than the amount of water would be. Now we're going to see where the idea for infant baptism came from a little later. And I'll, I believe you'll appreciate knowing when we do. But right now, let's spend a little more time looking at the most meaningful baptism in history. And we're going to have to go to Mark chapter 1 to find it. Mark 1 Verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Yeshua, Jesus, came from Nazareth, Nazareth of Galilee and, bat, and was baptized of John in the Jordan. And straightway coming out, up, out, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You know, if I were to choose to follow the Lord's steps, and I do, 
there are three things I would want. I would want to go down into the water. I would want to come up out of the water. And I would want God to be well pleased. I wouldn't be satisfied with any less. Neither the apostles. And so they were quick to follow the example. And so they have these old baptistries. This is very likely why the churches of the early ages had pools four foot deep and twelve foot across. I met a minister once that said the amount of water doesn't matter. He said, I baptized an invalid in her bathtub and he immersed her. And the very next day he baptized a lady in the Atlantic Ocean. There's a lot of difference with the amount of water. But we'll soon see the idea of baptizing, immersing, as a picture of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And that's what we believe in when we're baptized. Here's a group at the Jordan River. Uh, on one end and standing a little apart is yours truly, without the beard. It's just a few years ago. And I was able to baptize these people in the Jordan River. I'm standing in the Jordan River there. But I'm standing in the Jordan River in January. <laughs> I believe it was January. And that water was cold. Now, <laughs> there's only one other story about the mode of baptism in the Bible that I know of. And it's a well-known story about a man from Ethiopia. The story gives us a close-up view of Philip the Evangelist baptizing this Ethiopian in a pool of water. Now the Ethiopian was traveling homeward and reading an Old Testament prophecy about the Lord from Isaiah chapter 53. And the Spirit of God was sent to Philip to teach him. And you can tell what he taught by what they did. And so it's important for us to see what they did. Acts 8, 32-39. Here's the story. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shears, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And when they went on their way, they came to certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be immersed? Or if you pray prayer of the Greek, baptized. And Philip said, If thou believeth with all thine heart, thou mayest. Oh, there's that belief again. Believing with all the heart. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, Philip must have been some kind of teacher. He couldn't have just told him. He had to do a lot of explaining. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down, both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he immersed him, baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord kept, caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing which is usually the response of an honest, sincere baptism. When the person comes out of the water, there's a bit of joy, there's a bit of happiness. There's been a weight left in the water, and there is a new birth taking place. It's beautiful. Well, the method took both men down into the water, the preacher into the water with the man. That takes a lot of water. He immersed him, then they came up out of the water, and rejoiced. <laughs> Praise God. I want to tell you that a close study of the history of the early Christian church leads us to believe that infant baptism was introduced in about the third century after Christ. 
Now, one of the theological reasons for this was undoubtedly based on the concept of original sin. Since Adam sinned, it was taught, children are born <coughs> under the, the uh, curse and frown of Jesus. Can you see Jesus cursing and frowning at a baby? Churches used to teach, and some still do, that infant baptism proposes, proposes to remove this original sin and translate these tender babies from the kingdom of Satan to the church of Christ. That's the concept behind it. Now, while it is true that every son or daughter of Adam inherits within his nature the inevitable results of the father's transgression, it is not true that God holds the child guilty of the 6,000-year-old offense. That doesn't make sense. Neither is it just. Neither is it scriptural. Let's take a look. We're going to look then in Ezekiel 18, verse 20. And here it reads clearly, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Did you catch that? Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. That's right. Wouldn't be fair. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Friends, this was God's answer to the question, does the Son bear the iniquity of the Father? And the Bible says no. It was once taught, and I suppose some still believe, that God would send these helpless little babies to eternal hellfire to burn forever. And I want to tell you that there was a God, there is a would-be God that would be absolutely delighted to do that. His name is Baal. And he had babies burned at his altars time and time again. In fact, some people are still doing it. <clears throat> I left that God behind when I was baptized into the church that teaches God's commandments. Jesus neither frowned nor cursed babies, and the death on Calvary gave him the right to save both the innocent babe and the converted sinner. Let's read this. It was not until the Council of Ravenna in 1311 A.D. that sprinkling and pouring were officially accepted as equally valid as immersion in the rite of baptism. Now, I suppose it was because of convenience. It's a lot easier to use a sprinkling out of a little pitcher or something than it is to find a pool of water. The right for baptism will be different from individual to individual, but a very sound principle is this. When a person is old enough to understand sin, he's old enough to repent of it. When he's old enough to understand what took place at the cross, then he's old enough to believe in it. In fact, Yeshua clearly said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And once again, Jesus also made it very clear that young children are able to believe. They are believers. In fact, he cast a warning on any adults that would hold these uh, believing children back from following Christ. I want you to see this story. It's in Matthew 18, verse 6. Taking my time, serious subject, sacred material. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me? He's not talking about a baby. He's talking about a little child that can believe in him. One of these little ones which believe in me. It were better for him that a millstone 
were hanged around his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Wow. The Lord expects children in heaven. And when they're old enough to believe, he doesn't want any adult holding them back in any way. I would encourage her to move forward. I would never discourage her backwards. Sometimes a person is baptized into the church that's quite young and wanders away. Sometimes a young person that's not baptized into the church wanders away. But when either one of them decide to follow Christ, most always the one who was baptized into the right fellowship goes back to that original fellowship. There's something holding about that baptism. The baptism in the Lateran Church in the city of Rome has an interesting history. It sits in the center of an octagonal building behind a great church. It's 14 feet across with steps leading down from both sides. The fount is four foot deep. A friend of mine visiting Rome, the guide told him that it was here that Constantine the Great was baptized, head and all. <laughs> Wasn't that interesting? Yet it was Constantine in about 321 that wrote religious legislation that hurt a lot of people. Here we are at the Tower of Pisa. I understand that people were not allowed to enter the church until they were baptized into the in the baptistry. You know, it's interesting that there are no fewer than 66 such baptistries in old churches in Europe. And they all indicate one thing. Baptism by immersion in the formative years. Well, why? Why? What's the reason? We don't have to know the reason. When Christ tells us what to do, we just do it. But very often with a little study, we can find the reasons. We're going to look at one of them, and we're going to go to Romans 6, 1 through 5, to find it. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Some say, well, grace takes the place of sin, so you can go ahead and sin. <laughs> Bible never says go ahead and sin. It even describes very clearly what sin is. God forbid is his answer. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that as many as us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Remember, he was buried. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. If I were to be baptized, I would want to be buried. Because that's what it's about. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. After you're baptized, you should walk a different walk. You put on the covenant. You walk according to the principles of God laid down in his holy book. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, oh, this is so descriptive. You can't throw seeds on the ground and throw a little dirt over them. You've got to plant them. We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Oh, friends. As a person falls back in the preacher's arms, they are taking part in a scene which took place 2,000 years ago. When you allow your body to be buried in the water, you're telling the angels of God that you believe Christ died and was buried. And when you come up out of the water, you're a witness to the resurrection. This is the only holy God-ordained sign and memorial of the resurrection. A lot of people say Sunday is, but you know now that that's not scriptural. Baptism is. It took the devil a long time to mess those two up and confuse the people. 
Friends, baptism is a signal to two forces, to God's forces and Satan's forces, that you are a believer, that Christ came to this earth, that he died, that he buried, and that he was raised again. You are a believer. And this sign then is very special. It's very personal. It's very important. It's something that you can do for him as an honor to your Savior. Additional baptisms proves to be very meaningful to believers as well. I mentioned earlier that people sometimes were baptized more than once. Now let's look at the account of that. And we're going to go to Acts 19, 1 through 6. He came to Ephesus. Remember Ephesus where that big church was built? And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Wow. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Nothing wrong with that. John's baptism was great. He even baptized Jesus. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which is to come after him, that is, on Christ. Now when they heard this, they were immersed, baptized, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. Verse 10 says, And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they that which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Well, friends, there's certain powers, there's certain thrills, certain timing of God's will when a baptized, Bible-believing, born-again Christian has special strength to do works for God. Because the Bible often pictures the church as the bride of Christ. John the Revelator is filled with joy when he's given a beautiful vision of the Lord meeting his church. And his church is pictured as a bride at the second coming. Let's take a look. I think it's lovely and it has a good lesson to it. Revelation 19, 7 and eight. Here he's saying, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. The wife is the church, the bride. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is what? Is the righteousness of the saints. Friends, we must be a righteous people, and I say that humbly, not proudly. We become righteous by allowing the Holy Spirit to train us, by reading the Word to see what righteousness is, be willing to be taught and grow in the things of God. Friends, the most beautiful thing a person can do is to be merged by baptism into the body of Christ on earth. Oh, if I were Satan, I would do everything possible to cause a person to hesitate being baptized. I would find any excuse, and I would especially use pride because I know that's what people have. I would say, you'll mess up your hair. I would say, what would your friends think? What would some in some churches think if someone slipped away and was baptized into a fellowship that keeps God's commandments? What would my parents say? I can't be baptized, I'm too old. Hmm. I can't be baptized, I'm too young. My parents told me I'm too young, so I'm too young. I'm too ignorant of scriptures. I'm not sure of what I'm doing or why I'm doing it. Because somebody told me I wasn't. I'm too proud. I'm too weak. Oh friends, 
converted people. I remember a pastor and I visited in a home. And we visited a paraplegic. Couldn't move anything. Wanted to be baptized. We got a stretcher, a bright orange stretcher. And the deacons carried him down the aisle to the front, to the baptistry, where the pastor of the church and the evangelist were there. We strapped him tightly to that stretcher and then lowered one end into the water, feet end down. And then the pastor and I were at the top end holding that end up, which is easy with the buoyancy of water. And we baptized him. And he was joyful. And his family was joyful. Some people say they're too weak to be baptized. He was too weak. But praise God. Some say it's the wrong time or the wrong place. Or it's inconvenient. Friends, don't listen to Satan. He knows what baptism means. And he knows why Christ commanded baptism. And he knows the signal that it sends to glory. And he knows the angels that rejoice because of it. And he hates it. Is baptism necessary? What do you think? For every man, woman, boy, and girl who plans to walk in the new earth, it's important. Now to further the study about whether or not it's absolutely necessary to be immersed, I'm going to share three additional scriptures with you. Very positive scriptures. And the first one is going to be in John chapter 3, verse 5. Let's just turn there quickly. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he can not enter the kingdom of God. Being born of the Spirit means beginning the life of Christ by the working of the Spirit in the heart. I'm not worried about you being in the born of the Spirit. If you weren't born of the Spirit, you wouldn't be listening to this DVD. You see, in the first chapter of John, certain spiritual leaders rejected John's water baptism. No doubt this may well have been one of those very spiritual leaders coming to talk to Jesus. One of the spiritual leaders is told by the Lord, and he accepts being born out of the water, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> baptism is an important part of the new birth experience in fact there can be no growth and maturity without a birth baptism was never intended to be a graduation you don't know, have to know the whole word of God to be baptized you need to know the things he commanded the things that are important to your life that make life changes accept it accept Christ be willing to be baptized. One reason youth leave the church is because unborn children eventually die, spiritually. Now let's look at, page, at uh, Mark 16, verse 16, and we'll get a little more of its importance. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What does that say for those who don't believe and aren't baptized? Non-believer wouldn't be baptized. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Friends, here's truth for young or old, man, woman, boy or girl or whatever. Our Christ makes it clear that if a person has, doesn't have at least enough belief to be baptized of his own free will, there'll simply be no salvation. Friends, that's serious to me. That's salvational. That's why I'm taking my time with this beautiful subject, because I don't want anybody to miss out 
because I've been misunderstood. I mentioned four positive proofs of its necessity. Number one, to be merged in the body of Christ, especially to belong to the church of the firstborn. Number two, to be born, to be born again. How can you grow without a spiritual birth? Third, to be saved. That's obviously in this text. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And fourth, to show the world and the angels of God and the angels of the evil power that you're going to follow Yeshua as your Lord no matter what. Let's move on a little further. Matthew 3, verse 14 and 15. But John, about to baptize Jesus, but John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered them. Well, let me say something. If there was ever a person who did not need to have his sins washed away, it was Jesus. He was a son of God. He had no wickedness to bury. John the Baptist knew that. He wondered about it. That's why he said, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? The Lord had no disobedient past to bury. Why then was he immersed at the hand of John? I suggest three reasons. Number one, Jesus was immersed that his example for us would be complete. We are to walk in the steps of Christ. Number two, it also tells us that no one is so good that he need not be baptized. More than one person has said, I'm better than most of the people in that church, and they're all baptized, so why should I be baptized? <laughs> and number three, is to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, your Savior. The Lord has shown us the way. Now, here in this rite of baptism, we can do something for Him. Isn't that beautiful? He's done so many things for us. When I'm baptized, I'm doing something in honor of Him. There's so little we can do to honor Him. Now, I want you to notice what happened to Ananias when Ananias met Saul, who later became known as Paul. Notice his challenge regarding baptism. This would be in the book of Acts, of course, chapter 22, verse 12. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, Suddenly, oh, this is verse 6, shone from heaven a great light around me. But let's get down to verse 12. We'll, we'll go to those other verses in a minute. And one Ananias, a devout man according to law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. Saul had been blind. And the same hour I looked upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee that thou should know his will, to see Christ, the just one, and shouldst hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and do what? Wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. Well, let's do get a little more of the background of this story. I read verse 6 already. Look at verse 7. And I fell into the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? He said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid 
but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Rise, go to Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And the first thing that was appointed for Paul to do was to be baptized. God wanted to get Paul spiritually born. He had a big, immense work for him to do, and he needed to get going at it. There's a lot of people that would like to do things for God, but they're not born yet. What a shame. If Ananias were standing here today, in front of you, in front of me, would he not still say exactly the same thing? Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Someone reminded me of the thief on the cross once. He was certainly saved, but he couldn't be baptized. I remember a little gal in her 90s said she wanted to be baptized. I said that would be fine. But she said, I have a broken hip. And I said, well, how long will it take it to heal? Well, it probably won't. So I told her about the story of the thief on the cross. When it's impossible, God will accept you, if it's impossible. She was satisfied with that for about three days, and she called back and said, but pastor, I, I'm not nailed to a cross. I just have a broken hip. So a couple of deacons and my wife and I went down to the baptistry, which was in the basement of a church. And I took a 1 by 14 board and put it across the baptistry. And we wheeled Claire in in a wheelchair, which she didn't need. It was just for practice. And we sat her up on the, on the board and then moved her legs onto the inside of the pool with a nice baptistry ground over and slid her over to the middle of the baptistry. And then I slid Clara off the board onto one foot in the baptistry. And between my balancing her and the buoyancy of the water, she was perfectly comfortable. And I didn't say the words, but I took Clara through the right. I put her under water, brought her out, set her back up on the one by, and slid her back over her feet off and onto the wheelchair. Several times I did not want any problems with that dear sweet lady. Well, she came in and the church was watching as a wheelchair was brought up to the side of the baptistry. And the deacon and deaconess lifted her up and sat her on the one by. We slid her over, put her feet inside, slid her over to the center. And she smiled at me, a sweet smile, as she slipped off onto one foot. We withdrew the one by, and I baptized her. When she came up out of the water, she was full of joy. And so were the people in the audience, the kind of joy that brought tears down their eyes. Oh, that was a beautiful time. Friend, if you haven't been baptized, you need to study the Word of God to know the basic issues of the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments. Understand the ones that are practical, the other ones you'll learn later on from the churches from week to week, and hasten to be baptized. God is waiting. Heavenly Father, we do pray for the dear people in this audience, lovely people, many of them out there that have been baptized and weren't even sure why. But now they know. And there are others who have been baptized twice because they found some great new truth, like the people in the book of Acts. When they heard about the Holy Spirit, they were baptized a second time. They had been baptized by your servant John. Now they were baptized under Paul's direction because they learned a great new truth. 
Some of the people here have been listening to these DVDs and listening and hearing a great new truth. And they need to be washed. They need to be cleansed. They need to be set up on the path toward heaven. I pray, God, if there's anyone out there that your spirit is touching, that they will call us, write to us, see their pastors, whatever, and take care of what needs to be taken care of, that they might move on in this life with Christ and lead others into the kingdom of God and speak with the assurance of those who trust Jesus. For I pray it in the holy name of Yeshua. Amen.